All right, take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Genesis, chapters 32 and 33. <clears throat> uh, the last lesson we had here was, whenever it was, several weeks ago, and uh, pastor led us through uh, the conclusion of chapter 31, where Jacob is leaving Padan Aram, which is up where Syria is now. And that's where his mother had come from. His mother is Rebecca. And so after he got into that spat with um, his brother Esau, then he fled. Uh, they were living down in Beersheba, which is down in uh, the Negev, down in the southern part of um, Israel. So um, he fled and ran from the wrath of his brother Esau because Esau was out to kill him. And... Uh, Jacob had lived by his uh, wits and had lived by the rule of, I call it the rule of the selfie. Uh, he lived by the rule of self-will and by the rule of self-determination and by the rule of self-reliance and self-dependence uh, and everything was self. Uh, Jacob thought that uh, he could make life work and, and get by on his wits and ingenuity. And uh, for a long time, God let him get by with that. But in our lesson tonight, in Genesis chapter 32, God is going to meet him. Jacob is going to have a come to Jesus moment. And it's going to be the come to Jesus moment of his lifetime. So what God is going to do in Genesis chapter 31, he's going to meet this selfie man, this man who lives by the rule of doing everything himself in his way, and God is going to break him, and God is going to remake him into Israel. This is where the name change from Jacob to Israel occurs. So let's get into uh, chapters 32 and 33. Uh, just keep in mind also that uh, here in the book of Genesis, and Pastor keeps us up to date with this, but in the book of Genesis, we're not just talking about ancient history. We're not just talking about the history of our tradition and where we have come from. What we are looking at in the book of Genesis is the beginning of all things. And, of course, the beginning of all things in the book of Genesis is going to finally culminate in the book of the Revelation. So everything that's introduced in Genesis is going to be culminated in the book of the Revelation, but it's all going to be culminated through Christ. So let's keep in mind as we keep looking at the timeline, uh, I tell our, our Sunday school class all the time that if you want to understand where you are, you've got to pay attention to the timeline where you are on the timeline of history and the timeline of the covenant of God and the timeline of the gospel and then uh, keep up with your map, with your geography. So we're going to be looking at the timeline and looking at the geography that is going on in Genesis 32 and 33. But in, uh, when we talk about Jacob and talk about Israel, we are one of the primary prequels to the coming of Christ. Because when God renames Jacob and renames him into Israel, Israel is going to become the name, the covenant name of the people of God forever. It will always be the name of the people of God. Whenever God names Jacob Israel, prince with God, then that's going to become the, the name by which the people of God are going to be known. Even in the book of the Revelation, we go all the way to the book of the Revelation, and the people of God are called Israel, and uh, uh, Christians are brought into the Israel of God, and when we get to the book of the Revelation, when all of the people of God are congregated, and when they're all assembled in chapter 7, uh, John gives us there the, um, the numbers of the multitude of the redeemed. And he just gives it the round symbolic number of the 144,000. So the 144,000 are going to be made up of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And so Israel is still going to be the name, even in the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is going to have walls. And those walls are going to have names on them. They're going to have gates on them. 
And the names that are on the gates are going to be the names of the 12 sons of Israel, the tribes of Israel. And so we are going to become known as Israel from the story, from the story where we are tonight. So that's how significant it is in terms of being a prequel to Christ and a prequel to the gospel. I'm going to give just a broad general theme and um, um, just kind of give us a track to run on uh, for chapters 32 and 33. I'm going to call it the making of a man of God. And I'm calling it a man of God because Jacob is a man. So uh, the making of a man of God, we're going to use Jacob as a, as a supreme model. But what we are going to uh, find out tonight and discuss and discover from Genesis 32 and 33 is that it will apply also to you, dear sisters. So I'm just calling it the making of a man of God because we're dealing with a man, but you, dear sisters, are in on this lesson also. And so we are going to follow the progress. We're going to follow the, the, the transformation progress from God taking a man whose name is Jacob or heel grabber and uh, just... Whenever we get to it, it will maybe help things. If I just explain now what heel grabber means, uh, the name Jacob or Jacob uh, was given to him whenever he was born. That's in chapter 25 of Genesis. And so Jacob, they, they were twins, and they were fighting and struggling uh, even in uh, Rebekah's womb. But uh, Esau came out first. Esau came out as a hairy baby first and then Jacob came out second and Jacob had been struggling with Esau even in Rebekah's womb but when Jacob comes out or when the second baby comes out he is grabbing on to the heel of Esau and so he's actually following Esau out of the womb holding on to his heel now heel grabber in that culture and um, in that vernacular uh, whenever we talk about Jacob, we talk about the name Jacob meaning like uh, tricky, deceitful. And, and he's called tricky and deceitful because in that culture, a heel grabber was somebody who would come up behind you and throw you down by tripping you from behind. So you'd blindside somebody, come up from behind them and then cut their feet out from under them somehow or trip them up somehow, and that was called grabbing the heel. And so that's the way Jacob did everything that he did. He, he, would, he would grab people by the heel. He would deceive. He would contrive. He would manipulate. He would cheat. And so just getting back to him and um, Esau, he had already uh, cheated Esau, out of his birthright for that bowl of soup that, um, that Esau had, um, had sold him his birthright for when he came in from hunting. And then when their father Isaac was dying, father Isaac was blind, couldn't see who he was looking at. And so Jacob deceived his father into thinking that he, Jacob, was Esau, the firstborn, and then through that deceit, he got the birthright so, uh, or, or the blessing. So he got the birthright from Esau through deceit, got the blessing from his father through deceit, and that's how he ended up in Padan, uh, Padan Aram to begin with. So let's pick up the story in uh, chapter 32 of Genesis. But before I read the scripture... I want to read a poem. I know we're supposed to read the poem at the end. We're supposed to have three points and a poem, but I want to read the poem at the beginning. And uh, this poem, it's, um, uh, it's, it's in pretty wide circulation. You can find it on the Internet. And uh, the first time most of us remember seeing it was uh, J. Oswald Sanders wrote a book on spiritual leadership uh, early in the, uh, the last century. And uh, he, he quoted this, this poem, and it's, it's uh, attributed to author unknown, but uh, it's called The Making of a Man. And I discovered this poem a long time ago, and uh, it, it, it's very poignant. And uh, as I read it, 
I want you to see if it resonates with you. I want you to see if you recognize uh, what the poem is saying and then what we'll talk about in Genesis chapter 32. So, the making of a man. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when God yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall stand amazed, watch his methods and watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which only God understands while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands. How God bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him. By every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. God knows what he's about. And so Genesis chapter 32 is the story of a struggle between Jacob and God. And I'm just going to give you an advance notice. God always wins. God always wins. God always makes you into what he wants you to be. You can struggle. You can resist. You can fight. God will have what he wants you to be. And God will make you what he wants you to be. So, I tell you what, let's read, um, let's just go ahead and read chapter 32. And then I will go back and then we will begin developing it. Chapter 32 of Genesis, beginning in verse 1. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Maonel. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell you, my lord, in order that I may find favor in your sight." And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and there are 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels into two camps, thinking, If Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps." Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he stayed there that night. And from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 uh, milking camels and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys, and these he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me and put space between drove and drove. And then he instructed the first, When he saw my brother meet you and ask you, To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and third and all who followed the droves. 
You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, Moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and, and, and everything else. Pages are sticking. So he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he, the man who was wrestling with Jacob, then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to verse 1, and I'm going to trace the steps and the stages of the making of of a man of God. We pick up in verse uh, 1 of uh, chapter 32, and the first stage, at least on this stage of his return trip, I'm just calling it on the way home. Jacob is very excited. He is on the way home. It has been 20 years since he's been back in the territory where he is right now. 20 years ago is when he deceived his father, stole the blessing from his father, that belonged to his older brother, and then had to leave and go to Padan Aram. So that was 20 years ago. All of this has transpired in the past 20 years, and he has not had any contact with his brother. But he's on his way not only back home to see his father and mother, but he knows that on the way back home, he's going to have to have an encounter with his brother, and he has no idea how that encounter is going to go. So he is on the way home. Here is what I want you to notice as he is on the way home because now we've already read through the story so we know what's going to happen. But I want you to understand that when God has an encounter in store for you, when God has an encounter planned for you that he needs you to encounter in order to bring you to the next stage of development that he wants you to come to, in order for you to do what he has next for you to do, then God knows exactly where to place you. And God knows how to put you on the path to where you are going. I want you, as we go through the lesson tonight, I just want you to think of some of the times when you've had encounters with God. When God has met you, when you've struggled with God, when God had to prevail over you in order to maybe break your will or to break your agenda in some particular area of your life where you were trying to stand in the way between what God had called you to do and what you yourself may have been wanting to do. So he's on the way back home. Uh, chapter 31, it, uh, Jake, uh, verse, verse 1 says, um, Jacob went on his way. Uh, signifying that he had just had the encounter in the end of chapter 31 with Laban, who had chased after him. Jacob didn't tell his father-in-law Laban that he was leaving. And uh, so he left not only with Laban's daughters and with all of his family, with, with Jacob's family, but with all of this livestock 
we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But, you know, you, you've, seen, you've seen pictures in Westerns about, you know, the cattle drives that they used to have uh, out, out in the West. And we have no idea how many total head of livestock and animals that Jacob had with him. But all of this, all of this caravan is now coming down into the land of, of Israel, coming down into the land of Canaan, as, as it was called then. And so Jacob, the point I want to make is that J Jacob knows where he's going. He knows the direction that he's going. He knows roughly the destination that he wants to go to, but he has no idea, has no idea how the path is going to develop as he goes. And so as he goes on his way, there are some companies who meet him. They are supernatural companies. There are some angels who meet him. Because the next phrase says, and the angels of God met him. As a matter of fact, there are several angels of God that met him because Jacob is so impressed with their presence and with their numbers that whenever he saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And so he called the name of that place Maenaim. Maenaim simply means two camps. Two camps. So there are two camps who are here. Now you tell me. You're, you're looking at it. You're, you're reconstructing this story in your mind as we go. And so Jacob is coming in spite of all of his self-assuredness, in spite of all of his self-confidence that he's lived his life with, there is a certain degree of trepidation because he, his future is really out of his hands. He cannot control the future. He doesn't know what the future is going to hold. He'll have to discover it as he comes across it. And so as he is walking into his future, which he does not know, there is another camp that meets him. It's a camp of supernatural beings, a camp of angels. And so Jacob calls it Maenam, two camps. So you tell me, who are the two camps? Let me give you a hint. Jacob and his camp is one camp. So who's the other camp? Say it. The angels. The angels are the second camp. So Jacob recognizes he's not here alone. You are not alone. You are never alone. As a matter of fact, what this is going to do for Jacob is, this is going to flash him back all the way to chapter 28, 20 years ago, when Jacob was fleeing from Beersheba, and he was running from the wrath of his brother. He is going alone. Jacob loved his mother. You know, Esau was more of a, a, a daddy's boy, an outdoorsman. Jacob, he and his mother were very close. He was kind of a mama's boy. He was more domesticated than Esau was. And so here, 20 years ago, here is this young man who has had to run away from home had to flee for his life. He is going where he's never been. He's going up to where his mother came from. He's got some names that he's looking for when he gets there, but he's never been there. He never lived there, did not come from there, doesn't know what life is like there, but that's where he's going. And then late one night, he falls asleep from, or he, he, he falls from exhaustion, and he is traveling so light I mean, he left everything behind, took nothing with him except what he could carry in a, in a, in a bag on, a, on, on his back. And he didn't even have a my pillow with him, a travel my pillow. And so that night he took a stone for a pillow and, and he laid his head on a rock in order to try to get some rest. He was afraid to go into the village because he didn't know whether he could trust the people in the village. So here he is out in the elements in the dark, alone for the first time in his life, going somewhere he doesn't know. And that night, God appears to him in a dream. And this is the dream of the ladder. And so God appears to him in this dream. And in this dream, Jacob sees a ladder, a stairway, a stairway to heaven that is set up from, from the ground to heaven. And he sees angels, angels, supernatural beings, otherwise invisible, 
to the, to the physical eyes. But he sees all of these beings, and they must be around all the time. It's just that in his dream, he's able to see them. And so he sees these angels, and they are ascending and descending. Notice the order. They are ascending and then descending. Now, if you ascend up the, uh, up the staircase, then that means that your point of origin is here. Your point of origin is here. So the angel's point of origin and operation and activity is here. And they're all around us. They're all around us. So he sees the angels, this young boy, lonely, in the dark sees this stairway, and the angels are ascending, and then they get further orders and instructions, and they descend. And then he wakes up, and he says, this is the gate of heaven. I've been in the presence of God. This place is awesome. And so he calls the name of that place Bethel. So now, 20 years later, that happened on the way up. 20 years later, he's on the way back home, and, and he sees a vision of these angels, these two camps that, that are with him. And so he recognizes that he's still not alone. God had told him back in that vision in chapter 28, I'm, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to stay with you. I will not leave you until I have performed everything that I have told you that I would do. And so Jacob recognizes that he is not alone. He's on his way home, and he is not alone. Now, what he needs to do, beginning in verse um, 2, what he needs to do is he needs to announce his arrival to his brother. He knows that his brother, his brother Esau, Beersheba is over where they grew up and came from. It's over on the um, west side of the Jordan. And so what Esau has done is Esau has built a kingdom. I mean, God has blessed Esau. Esau has become a nation. And so Esau has gone across the Jordan, across the Dead Sea, and so Edom is, is where Esau uh, camps, where he's kind of built cities and, and built a, a, a kingdom. And so Jacob is coming down from Syria, and he's coming down the east side of the Jordan. And so he knows he's coming into the area where Esau lives and where Esau roams. Esau's a, a, a roamer. And so uh, he, he needs to send word to his brother. Because he does not want Esau to just discover that he's back in the country and then make a surprise visit to Jacob. So Jacob says, I'm going to be preemptive. I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to send my brother Esau a notice. And so Jacob sent these messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing him. And so he, he tells the, the messengers who go. He said, now, I want you to go. I, I want you to find my brother, meet my brother, and you give him advance notice, give him a heads up that I am coming into the country. Tell him that I'm coming back home. And then I want you to notice the language, though. Uh, back in 25, chapter 25, when Jacob and Esau were born, God told Rebekah that these two twins were struggling in her womb. But then God told her, he said, one of them is going to be stronger than the other and the elder of them will serve the younger. So, Rebecca knew, even before the children were born, that the firstborn is actually not going to be the stronger of the two. The firstborn is actually going to serve the younger, which was Jacob. But I want you to listen now to Jacob's language. What Jacob has learned over the past 20 years is a remarkable degree of humility. And Jacob understands diplomacy. And he understands that he's on kind of on the short uh, end of this stick. And so he needs to show the proper deference to his brother because actually his brother is more powerful in terms of military might and physical strength than, than he is. And so he instructed the servants, beginning in verse 4, instructing them. Thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, be sure to call him my Lord and tell him that you are coming from his brother and his brother is calling him my Lord. Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male servants and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And so Jacob 
is appealing to his brother for favor. He's appealing to his brother for, uh, for, for reconciliation and to receive him in peace. So the messengers returned to Jacob, uh, verse 6. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau, and um, he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. Now, if the first section was on his way home, if the second section was announcing his arrival, I'm going to call this third section here meltdown. It is meltdown time. Uh, the next phrase says, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. That is probably an understatement. Greatly afraid and distressed. Don't raise your hand. <clears throat> but does anybody here deal with like acute anxiety or panic attacks? Have you ever had a panic attack? Have you ever had like under stress uh, just some sort of very um, emotional just meltdown when you had no control over your emotions, no control over your, uh, over your body, and you tremble and you sweat and you hyperventilate, and you have to rub your hand on your face in order to keep from having an out-of-body experience. <laughs> and that's kind of where Jacob is. I have no idea whether Jacob had panic attacks, but this is too good an opportunity to pass up not to have a major meltdown and a panic attack because he has no idea what to expect from his brother. But his brother is coming to meet him and 400 warriors are with him. And so then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. This is another step that God is leading him into. God will allow you to become afraid. God will allow you to become distressed. If there is any sense of self-confidence that you want to hold on to, thinking that you, through yourself and by yourself, can accomplish whatever you want to accomplish, or you can make your own life, or you can govern your own life, or you can make your own way, God will bring you into fear. God will bring you into major distress. God knows how to melt you down. God knows how to break you down. And this is where it begins with Jacob. And so... He was greatly afraid and distressed, uh, distressed. So he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two camps thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Now, this is reasonable. I mean, we're not going to fault Jacob for making provisions. What Jacob is actually doing here is he's being a good husband. He's being a good father. He's being a good protector over those that God has put into his responsibility. And so Jacob has no idea what is, what's going to transpire. He knows he's got to have the encounter. There's no way to go back to, to uh, Padan Aram. He cannot go back where he came from. He's got to have this encounter with his brother. But he's not in control of it. So what he says is, well, let's just get by with the least number of losses that we can. So I'll divide them up into two camps, separate them. So while one camp is being massacred, if that's what happens, then the other camp can escape. So we're not going to fault him with making those provisions. And so then the next step is Jacob prays. Uh, and again, God has ways to make you pray. I mean, God has ways to make you want to pray. God has ways to make you need to pray. And if you're not prone to pray to begin with, then God knows how to bring you to the place where you're going to be willing to pray, even if it's because you have nothing else to do. Interestingly, this is the first recorded prayer that is in the Old Testament. I know we're early in the, in the book of Genesis, only 32 chapters in the book of Genesis. Now we're sure that people prayed before, but this is the first recorded verbal prayer that is prayed in the Old Testament. And look who is praying it. Jacob is praying it. Good old self-reliant Jacob is praying the first prayer that's prayed in the Old Testament. And uh, Jacob is praying very humbly. 
He's praying very simply. I was talking with, um, I was talking with, with one of you uh, this past Sunday. And you were talking about some distress that you were in. And you were talking about, you were talking about praying, but, but you had no idea whether God even heard your praying. You think that your praying is just so weak and um, so ineffective that uh, it may not qualify with God to pray, uh, ask prayer. And, of course, what I told you is I said, no, no. Uh, God does not require protocols. When you pray to God, God does not require protocols. What you do when you pray is you come to God in your distress. You blubber as best you can. If your blubbering doesn't even make sense to you, the Holy Spirit of God can intercede with groanings that cannot be uttered by you or understood by you. Your praying is your coming to God and you just pour out your distress. You pour out your heart to God. And so Jacob, I don't know, we don't have any record at all that Jacob has ever prayed in his lifetime. And um, we have records of God appearing to Jacob and talking to Jacob, but never do we have any uh, occasion or written record of Jacob ever calling upon God. But now Jacob says, beginning in verse 9, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, O Yahweh, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. Before we go any farther, what Jacob is doing is, Jacob is praying on the basis of words that God had already said. What he's doing is, He's repeating God's words back to him. And he's telling God, he says, O Father, O God of Abraham, O God of Jacob, I am here where I am because back in Padan Aram, you told me to get on the road and come back to where I'd come from. So I am here because you told me to come here. Then in verse 10, I want you to listen now to this humility. I'm telling you, he's learned a lot of humility over the past 20 years. And Jacob says, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. I want you to either underline, put a pencil line under that, highlight it, colored pencil somehow, and then up at the top so you can come back and find it again, I want you to put, I am not worthy of the least of your mercies. Because what Jacob is recognizing, and this is the first time we've ever heard anything like this come out of his mouth. Jacob is saying to God, I recognize now that what I am, what I have become, what I have in my possession, I did not make it. I did not create it. I did not make it happen. I am not worthy of the least of these blessings that you have shown to me. This covenant love, this faithful, steadfast love that you have shown to me. And then Jacob goes back 20 years ago. And he says, whenever I crossed Jordan the first time on my way to Padan Aram, I didn't have anything but my staff. And now I'm coming back. I'm crossing the Jordan again, and this time I'm coming back, and I have become a clan. I have become rich in livestock and servants and a family. And Jacob is crediting God with giving him everything that he has. So God's making progress, chipping away at his selfiness. Then he says in verse 11, Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, he's still talking to God, bringing God's words back to him. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So that night, what he does that night is he creates, um, he creates what I'm just going to call overtures and offerings of peace. And so we read it a while ago, and the Bible says that Jacob divided up everything that he had into, into groups, 
and clusters. And then out of everything that he had, he just gathered some specimens. And he wants to make these into overtures of peace and offerings of peace. Uh, his little overture of peace and his offerings of peace are like 580 head of cattle and livestock. So you can, you can read it there. And he's got, he's got camels, he's got sheep, he's got donkeys, he's got cows. And so he takes all of the, these 580 uh, uh, head of livestock and he divides them up into at least three different groups. And so he puts them all on the road with their tenders and their herders. And he says, okay, he, he probably put the best ones first. And so he says, I want you to go and I want you to meet Esau. And whenever you meet Esau, Esau is going to say, uh, who are you and where do you come from? And I want you to say, my Lord Esau, your servant Jacob has sent these offerings to you because he wants you to have them. He wants to see your face in peace. He wants you to accept him. And so Jacob says, now, if he accepts the first one, then the second one will follow. However, if he starts attacking the, other, the, thir- the first one, then the other two of you turn around and run back and tell us, and we'll do the best we can do. But Esau accepted them. And so the first one comes, the second group comes, the third group comes. And so all of this is being done during the course of that day. Jacob does not yet know how all of that is going down. We come down to the next. This is really the crux of the matter. We come down to verse 22. In verse 22, I'm going to call it shelter in place. And so what he did that night was he took, he, he took his, his wives, took uh, Leah and Rachel, and then he took the servants, the, uh, the, the concubines, and he divided them up into three camps. And he separated all of them. And he wanted them to be as safe as they could be. What he did was he crossed the, 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 the Jabbok uh, River, the Jabbok Stream at a ford, at a, at, a, at a low place, shallow place. And so he took the three companies of his children and his wives and he sheltered them in place. And then begins the crux of the story. He goes back across the Jabbok River. And as he goes back across the Jabbok River, verse 24 says it all. And Jacob was left alone. When Jacob was left alone, God has him where he wants him. Now what God is going to do at this point is, God is going to bring Jacob finally to the end of himself in every way. All of Jacob's selfiness is going to be wrestled out of him. It's going to be broken out of him during this come to Jesus moment that that he's going to have. So he was left alone. There will come a point in everyone's life. We all love company. We all love fellowship. We all love to be together. We want to be together. We need to be together. We need to help each other. We need to comfort one another. We need to encourage one another. Weep with one another. Rejoice with one another. But there's going to come a time when you and God are going to be alone. And and that's where God wants you. And that's where God can best call you. And that's where God can best prepare you for what he is going to make of you. And so, Jacob was left alone. And the Bible says that there was a man who appeared. This is in the dark. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now, somewhere along the wrestling match, by the way, I'm calling this the main event. And there is no undercard. There's only one main event tonight. And that's Jacob wrestling with the man. Somewhere along the line, somewhere uh, during the main event that night, Jacob is going to learn that this man is God. But I don't think he knows it at the very beginning. Suddenly, somebody grabs him by the heel. Heel grabber is grabbed in the darkness. There's a man who leaps out of the shadows and and leaps upon him and begins to grapple with him. And Jacob begins to grapple with him. And the Bible says this wrestling match 
went on until the breaking of the day. Wrestling is just, it's one of the most intense exercises that you can engage in. And um, it requires all the attention of your mind, your adrenaline pumps, you are stretching and exercising every muscle in your body when you are wrestling. And this goes on all night long. I don't know whether they had any bells that rang. I don't think they had corners. I know they didn't have managers. I don't think there was any rest all night long. And so God is wrestling with Jacob all night long. And then it makes this amazing statement. It says, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob. Now, now stop right there. When the man who is wrestling with Jacob saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, that means that he could not pin him. He could not throw him down so that Jacob did not get back up. When the man who is God saw that he could not prevail against Jacob. Now, the question is, could the man have prevailed against Jacob? The man is prevailing against Jacob, except Jacob does not know it. Jacob is being taken. He's being had right now. But the man is letting Jacob get the best of him. The man is letting Jacob resist. The man is letting Jacob wrestle with him until Jacob has nothing else to wrestle with. The man is wearing him out. The man knows how to wear you out. I've been worn out. I, I know what it is to be worn out. I know what it is to be so physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally exhausted from trying to have my own way that I finally come to the one who is wrestling with me and say, What's the deal? What's the deal? You tell me. You tell me what you want. You tell me what this is all about. Because I'm done. I am spent. And so the man is just allowing Jacob to wear himself out until Jacob has nothing else to wrestle with. And then the man says, in verse 26, then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. Jacob at this point cannot let him go because Jacob by this time has realized that this man that he is wrestling with is a divine being. He may be an angel. Jacob calls him, he's seen God face to face. Uh, he may be an angel, but, but he's wrestling for God. And so it's, it, it's God. Jacob says, I've seen God face to face. And so Jacob understands that he is wrestling with God. And now he is spent. He has nothing else to wrestle with. He has nothing else to go on. He has nothing else to draw from. And so Jacob says to the man, no, I can't let you go. Because if I let you go, then I have nothing. If I let you go, then I fail. If I let you go, then I go nowhere else from here. And so Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now what Jacob has learned at this point is that any success in his life, any effectiveness in his life is not going to come from his selfiness. He is not going to create it. He's not going to make it up. He's not going to whomp it up. He is not going to make it happen on his own. Jacob recognizes that if any of these promises that have been made to him, these covenant blessings that have been promised to him, if they come to pass, it'll be because God gives the blessing that his father laid his hands on him for 20 years ago. And so Jacob has come to the place where he recognizes he needs God. He needs God. Jacob was at least converted in the sense of turned around and changed. He may have been saved. Jacob has a relationship with God at this time that is personal, that is sincere, 
that is humble, that is intensely spiritual. And so God then says to Jacob, I love this. God says to Jacob, he says, before, before he lets him go, he says, what is your name? So they're locked. They're locked in this, in this struggle. Jacob is about to die from exhaustion. And the man says to Jacob, he says, what is your name? Come on, tell me, what is your name? Say it. What is your name? Jacob finally says, Yaakov, Jacob. This is not in there, but I think the man probably said, you know what Jacob means, don't you? Jacob means heel grabber. Jacob means that you have lived your life, you have tried to get everything that you have gotten on your terms, by your wits, by your wisdom, by your ingenuity, that is your name. Look at yourself. Admit it. Confess it. Your name is Jacob. You just said it. And then God says, but I'm going to call you Israel. Israel means one who has struggled with God. There is a difference in struggling against God and struggling with God. Up until tonight, Jacob has been struggling against God. It's been Jacob against God and everybody else. Tonight, Jacob is not struggling against God. Tonight, Jacob is struggling with God. And that's why the Bible says, it's over in the book of Hosea. We cannot go there now. Hosea chapter 12, verses 2 through 6. Jacob wrestled with God and prevailed. He had power with God. And that's the way you get power with God. You get power with God by surrendering. You get power with God by confessing. My name is Jacob. But by the grace of God and by the blessing of God upon me, I can be and I will be Israel. And when your name is Israel, you are favored with God. God is for you. Israel means a prince with God, but it's kind of extrapolated. It's, it's a prince with God. You're a ruler with God because God has struggled with you and broken you and beat you. And then God has remade you in his own image. And so that's when he became Israel. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's who you are. You are Israel. God loves you. God favors you. God accepts you. God has you. Not because you're worthy of the least of his mercies, but God has you because of your name's sake, who is Christ, who is Christ Jesus, who is the Israel of God. And the prince, the Israel of God has come. and His name is Jesus. And he has bought us and redeemed us. And we are in him. And he is with us. And we're the people of God. We're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have struggled with God. And the only struggle that's going to count is the struggle with God. And that is God doing his work through us. We make a mistake. Here is what we think. We think that what gives us street cred in the kingdom of God is our strengths. So we come with our skill sets. And we come with our experience. And we come with our gifts. And we come with the things that we're good at. And the things that we can do. And we think that gives us street cred with God. I'll tell you what will give you street cred with God. When you come to God and you have nothing. When you come to God and you are broken, and you come to God and you've got weaknesses, and you come to God and you say, I can't. And God says, no, you can't. That's why you come to me. And so it's like the Apostle Paul who said, I wrestled with God. Three different seasons, I intensely wrestled with God. And because of the abundance of revelations that were made known to me, God gave me this hip out of joint. The man who was wrestling with Jacob 
pulled his hip out of joint. Jacob limped for the rest of his life, by the way. I limp. You, I don't limp physically. I limp. You may not know what my limps are. You, you limp. You limp in your own way. And God gives us these limps just to keep reminding us that we belong to him. And so um, Jacob limped for the rest of his life, and that's what qualified him. That's what qualified him to be a servant of God. So what will qualify you to be the Israel of God is your faults, your failures, your brokennesses, your incompetencies, and you bring all of those to the God of Israel. And you say, I surrender. Here I am. I have nothing to offer you. You have everything to offer me. And God makes you his Israel. Chapter 33, Esau receives him. So read chapter 33 and all's well that ends well. They had a happy reunion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your love that you have given to us. Thank you most of all for, thank you for covering all the bases. Thank you for ruling our lives. Thank you for all the ways we limp to keep reminding us of how much we need you. And thank you most of all for the fullness of grace that is in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Make our lives useful to you and for your praise and glory. In the name of your son, the Lord Jesus, amen.